Okay, are we going? Yes. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Fine, I'll see you in court. And Rish Outfield. And I'll see you in hell! Oh, what was that voice that would go, Attention, emergency, you now have three minutes to reach minimum safe distance. Of course, that's way too long for a greeting. This is the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Nick. <laughs> Episode 93. Cool. I am Rish Outfield. I'm Big Anklevich. We are your hosts. Each and every time we show up <laughs> here. That's right. Every time when it gets to be that time of the time. Okay. When it's that time of the month, you can count on Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield arriving in your home. You didn't it? just say what I think you said, did you? Maybe that should be our promo that we send out from now on. <laughs> when it gets to be your time of the month, think of Big Anklevich. I know I do. <laughs> sure, just dig yourself in deeper. So, hey, we've got another story. Um, yeah. Today's story is The Alarm by Harris Tobias. No, no, no. Surely Tobias Harris. You would think, but in fact, it's Harris Tobias. Well, well let's do it both ways, just in case. By Tobias Harris. Yes, do it Tobias Harris, do it Harris Tobias, and then just do it like John Harris. By John Harris. Thank you. Okay. We covered all our bases. This is why you don't have a Parsec Award, Rish. Yes. About the author. Harris Tobias. Okay. You were right. I should have, I should have trusted you. <laughs> lives and writes in Charlottesville, Virginia. He is the author of several novels and dozens of short stories. His fiction has appeared in Ray Gun Revival, mm. The Calliope Nerve, Literal Translations... Fried fiction. Fried? Fried fiction. Ah. Down in the dirt. Electric flash. Boogie, woogie, woogie. <laughs> e fiction. And several other publications. Yow! Ow! His poetry has appeared in Vox Poetica, The Poem Factory, and The I, Poetry I'm, Super I'm High. Sorry to interrupt you. We don't talk about poetry. Oh, that's right. I don't know what I was thinking. Sorry. And you can also find links to his novels in the show notes. We'd like to thank Marshall Latham. Marshall, for, Marshall, Marshall. <laughs> for producing today's episode. Also, Marshall was today's narrator. His wife, Kelly Latham voices on the show as well as brian lincoln and today's music is by matthias westland you can check out links to everything in the show notes the alarm by harris tobias A terrible clanging in the middle of the night roused me from my bed. I put on some clothes and hurried into the street, there to mingle with my bleary-eyed neighbors. At first we thought it was a fire, but there was no smoke or flame to be seen. We stood in the cold and beat our arms. The cold air made ghosts of our breath. The clanging didn't let up, so we traced it to its source. It came from the old tower on the edge of the village. The round stone structure had stood there for as long as the village itself. Silent, locked, and largely forgotten, it stood watching over the village like a rotten tooth. Its thick oak door locked tight, the key long ago lost. I suppose a monkey or an agile youth could have climbed it, but no one bothered that I ever heard of. Now it had suddenly come to life, and was sounding an alarm that no one knew what for. There is one who might remember, said the mayor. Old Havermeyer, the beggar. So we hurried over to his hut and shook him from his slumber. Old Havermeyer was so old that he was almost completely blind and deaf. He lived in poverty in a tiny shack on the edge of the village, 
subsisting on handouts and the begrudging charity of the village's wealthy merchants. He hadn't heard the alarm and didn't understand what we were so excited about. So we got him dressed and brought him to the tower and placed his hands on the oaken door so he could feel the vibrations. Only then did realization dawn on his wrinkled face. Ah, he said, the tower, the alarm sounds, the dragon wakes, we must flee. This statement caused no end of confusion amongst the good people of the village. Our village was prosperous and peaceful, unused to emergencies of any kind. What dragon? Many villagers wanted to know. There are no dragons, said others. Absurd. Superstitious nonsense, interjected the more educated. The incessant clanging continued shouting out all reason and rational thought, so we hurried away to the schoolhouse where we could hear ourselves think. We stamped the snow off our boots and lit the stove, and soon we could hear old Havermeyer tell us what he remembered of the tower, the alarm, and the dragon. When I was a boy... He spoke in a weak, quavering voice that we had to strain to hear. My grandfather told me that his grandfather helped build the tower. In those days, the, the dragon would come every few years and lay waste to half the village. It would fly in like a great winged bird, spitting fire, trample the crops, and eat the peasants. It was a force of nature. Nothing and no one could stop it. The only way they knew to save themselves was to give it gold. All the gold. For, for if any of us held back, the dragon would know, and its vengeance would be swift. Dragons love gold more than anything, and when they wake... They are hungry for it. These are only old stories to scare the children, said the mayor. It's been over 200 years since your grandfather's time, and no one has ever seen or heard of a dragon. It's all nonsense, I tell you. Well, those old stories scared me plenty, said the old man. I, for one, have never forgotten them. They say a buried chain connects the tower to the dragon. One end is fastened to the bell, and the other to the dragon's leg. When the dragon stirs, the bell rings. It gives us time to get away or, or get our gold together, whichever way we decide to save ourselves from ruin. This was just too much for many villagers to absorb. The whole idea of a fire-breathing dragon in this modern age was ridiculous. I'm not going to flee my home or lose my fortune because of a bunch of old legends, was the general consensus. Or, on the say-so of a senile old man, was the unspoken subtext. But the seed of fear and doubt had been planted. Do as you see fit, said the old man. My time in this world is nearly done. I'm too old to flee, and I have no gold. But I'll stay and share your fate. I'm curious to know if the old stories are true. And on this ominous note, old man Havermeyer closed his eyes and said no more. At that moment, the incessant clanging from the tower stopped, just as suddenly as it began. The sudden silence struck us all as louder and more worrisome than all the clamor, for it meant that the dragon, or whatever it was, had either gone back to sleep or had broken the chain and was awake. We were a tired and nervous bunch as we shuffled back to our homes. The sky was already beginning to lighten in the east, and we hurriedly agreed to meet again at noon the next day. Come to the village office, said the mayor. After we have had some time to think about what to do. The mayor was a good man, a widower, and my only real friend. He was respected by the villagers, but not loved. I don't know if their village had much love to spare. The next day dawned bright and clear. Whatever sense of gloom and disaster remained from the night before was drowned out by a cloudless blue sky and a brilliant yellow sun. We joked and laughed at our fear 
as we went about our morning chores. Someone pointed to the mountain that towered above the village. It was ringed by clouds, or was it dragon smoke? The townsfolk eyed their mountain nervously, as if at any moment that old familiar friend might visit flaming death upon them. <laughs> that morning the children went off to school. The mill wheel turned, and the blacksmith's hammer rang out. It was all so normal, the way it had always been, except that there was an undertone of fear and apprehension that infused our every move. At noon we all gathered at the mayor's office to discuss further what, if anything, we should do. Suggestions ranged from taking down the tower to digging into the village archives for more information. Some villagers thought the whole thing was a hoax, and others thought we ought to gather our gold together just in case. Finally, the mayor stood up and spoke. What we have here is a classic puzzle, he said to the crowded room. There's no denying that the alarm we heard was real. What we don't know is what it really means. We all looked at each other and nodded. At last, someone was speaking sense. The oldest man in the village remembers stories about a dragon and the old tower built as an alarm. No one knows if that is true. I propose we send someone into the mountains to seek out this dragon, if indeed there really is one. That's right. Here, here. This suggestion was met with general agreement. That seems like a good idea. That's quite sensible. Furthermore, continued the mayor when the hubbub died down, I also recommend we gather our gold and jewels together, and just in case the dragon proves real, that way we can buy him off and save our lives and property. If there's no dragon, we've lost nothing. If there is, we have saved everything. The village rose to its feet as one and applauded the mayor's good sense. The mayor asked for volunteers to go into the mountains and seek out the dragon's lair. The room grew very quiet, and no one stepped forward. In that case, I nominate Pierre Hansel, exclaimed the mayor. Every eye in the room turned to look at me, for Pierre Hansel is my name. I blushed scarlet and bowed my head. My nomination was quickly seconded, and I was chosen unanimously. In many ways, I was the logical choice for so dangerous a mission. I was unmarried, childless, and a relative newcomer, having lived in the village for only twenty years. Not only that, but I often spent weeks alone in the mountains, riding and gathering herbs. I knew the mountains better than most, and I was the most expendable. As a bachelor in a village filled with families, I was always a bit of a social outcast. The matchmaker had long ago given up trying to match me with any of the village widows and spinsters. So I accepted the mission and told the assembly I would leave immediately. I had never been so popular. My back was slapped and my hand was shaken by neighbors who hadn't spoken to me in years. We will gather our gold and jewels here, said the mayor. I myself will record your donations. Everything will be returned when the crisis is over. Bring everything you have. Remember what the old man said about hoarding. I went home and packed my rucksack and my blanket and headed out for the long march into the hills. It was fine weather, and I made good time. As I climbed, the hills grew steep, and the trees thinned until I was above them. I could see the great mountain ahead and my tiny village far below. I thought about how I lived there for so long, and yet was not accepted as one of them. How willing they were to send me off to find their dragon, but not willing to invite me into their homes. They were a small-minded, superstitious lot. Cruel and stingy, they distrusted everyone, including each other. I thought about what I was doing. They thought I was brave. Maybe I was. I loved being out in the wilderness and looked forward to spending a couple of peaceful nights under the stars. After three days, I stumbled into the village, a soiled and ragged mess, my clothes charred and my hair smoking. I announced to the council that it was all true. After a hard march, I stumbled upon the dragon's lair. I was frightened, and when the creature saw me, I was nearly devoured on the spot. The council gasped 
and sat in stunned silence as I told my tale. It was the closest of calls. The dragon is bigger and more fierce than anything I could imagine. It has been sleeping for two hundred years, and it is hungry. It plans to ravage the village, devour us all, and burn our homes to the ground. The fear in the room was a physical thing. Only one councilman had the wit to ask. You spoke with it? It can speak? Oh, yes. It speaks all right, and it spouts fire with every breath. Here, I rolled up my sleeves and showed them my fire-singed arms. <gasps> they all gasped as one. How much time do we have? <laughs> did, did you tell them about the gold? What will become of us? Now the whole group was speaking at once. They were panicked and afraid, as well they should be. Order! Order! Called the mayor and pounded the table. Let the man speak. I told the beast about the gold and pleaded for our lives. Old man Havermeyer was right. Only gold can distract the dragon from its hunger. I told it we would give it all the gold and jewels we have if only it would leave us alone. Yes, yes, yes. 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 They cried as one. Give it the gold and let it leave us alone. Let it sleep for another two hundred years. I can take the gold to the dragon as I know the way. How much is there? Can I carry it myself? Just a minute, said the mayor. The gold is my responsibility, and there is far too much for one man to carry. I shall go with you and make sure everything is as you say. Very well, I said. There was that old note of distrust I had always felt in this town. The mayor refused to meet my gaze. He divided the gold into two heavy sacks, which we placed on a wooden sleigh. We bid the frightened villagers farewell, and headed out to bargain for the village's safety. It was already late in the day. Thankfully, there was a full moon to light our way. We didn't stop to make camp. Our sense of urgency kept us going all night long. We trudged up into the hills, retracing the way I had made a few days before. We climbed above the tree line and looked back on our sleeping village. Around midnight, we changed course and headed toward the pass between the mountains. The snow was deep and the going rough. We had not spoken to each other the entire way. Talking took all our strength to drag the heavy sled through the snow. I was tired, and the mayor was nearly exhausted being older and sorely out of shape. We were forced to stop and rest many times. When we reached the pass, we continued over it and headed down the other side until we reached a fork in the road. There we stopped to rest. Did you remember to pay the boy who rang the bell? I asked. The mayor nodded. How about old Havermeyer? Did you pay him for his story? I did everything you asked, my friend, the mayor said, getting to his feet. He slung his heavy sack over his shoulder. Well, Pierre, he said, offering me his hand. We are both rich men now, just as you predicted. And the villagers will assume the dragon ate us and took the gold. They will be grateful for the peace it has brought them. <laughs> Enjoy your wealth, and may we meet again some day. No, I doubt it. He went to the left toward Urchin and Samarkand. I went right toward Persia and Damascus. The mayor was right. We would never meet again. Author's Note The Alarm was originally published in Thrillers, Killers, and Chillers webzine in September of 2010. It was written in an attempt to tell a story involving a dragon that didn't sound like a typical fantasy tale. I set the story in the real world, but an earlier, more superstitious time. Although the story does not say where or when exactly, I pictured it in the Middle Ages in some mountainous European country. Since dragons don't exist, I needed a story that would convince the town fathers that the threat was real. This was more difficult and a challenging an assignment than writing a story where dragons were an actual menace. As the story developed, making it into a con became the only logical explanation. 
And so the old Dragon Con story was born. Ah, see what he did there? No. Oh. Okay. Well, I uh, hope you enjoyed the story, folks. Welcome back. Oh, is that my line? No. Yeah. I just paused for dramatic effect. Thank you, Mr. Paris or Mr. Tobias, whichever is applicable, for sending <laughs> us that story. And uh, thank you, Marshall Latham, for producing. That's right. Now, is this the second story that Marshall has produced for us or in a, the first? In a way, it is. Oh, that, that one, <laughs> the Great right. White Whale episode still <laughs> still swims beyond our reach, and, and I'll never forgive it for mutilating me. <laughs> That's true, yes, it, it's still out there, and you've got the peg leg to prove it. He, he's, he's on his second story, but the first one is still uh, missing some elements. Well, we won't really talk about that one until it's time to talk about that one, but he showed some intestinal fortitude to come back and say, I'll do another episode for you after handling that one. That's right. I, I, you know, maybe what we should do from now on is when somebody produces an episode for us is we should plug their stuff, you know, to give their website and all that just so that you can sleep well at night. Okay. That sounds like a good idea. What can you tell me about Marshall? Well, Marshall, he's read on the Dribblecast. So if you if you like Marshall, you can go over to the Dribblecast, which is like the Drabblecast, except for not. Well, it's fans of the Drabblecast. Right. And I believe it's... Just Drabbles, right? They, they don't do, like, big stories, well, do they? Well, normally you would say it's just Drabbles, but he came to me a couple of months ago and asked if I would do a voice on a story... That he was producing for the dribble cast, and it, so it was an actual story. It wasn't just a oh. hundred words. Oh, and uh, that may be where I first met Marshall. Cool. You've been on that. He's apparently done stuff for Starship Sofa, Cast Macabre, and now for the Dune Steve. Good podcasts, all. He's uh, also been putting up audio stories of his own, as well as some others that he's read on uh, his website which is called Swamp Stories, and you can check out the link in the show notes. And uh, you can also look at his blog, which also will have the link in the show notes. So yeah, there's lots of things to plug. Um, he was also attacked by a face hugger and then later ripped to pieces by aliens in the Drabblecast's Halloween special. Oh, I'm sorry to hear. Uh, Mrs. Latham, I'm sorry to hear for your loss. And uh, I don't know why we're plugging any of his stuff if he has passed away. <laughs> Once the well has dried up, you know, you got to get what you can out of the water that you've gotten from it already. So, you know, it's like it's that, that dude from Sublime. You remember that guy? He died before the album was even released. And so they sold the crap out of that thing just to get his wife and family something to live off of for the rest of their lives. So, you know, there's that. One good reason to plug him. He's not really dead, though, right? Were you just playing along? Or, uh, <clears throat> well, are there really face huggers and aliens? Not as such. All right, so there you have it. If you are a fan of the Doonstief and you would like to help us produce one of our stories, just let us know at editor at doonstief.com, and you can be like the great Marshall Latham. That's right. Or, or I'm sorry, he's been promoted Sheriff Latham now. Oh. It's been so long since he did this that I guess that's not really a funny joke, but uh, <laughs> you get what you pay for. Yeah. If, if you would I like to help do. us out, we really appreciate it when somebody comes and says, I'll take a story off your hands. I will cast all the voices. I will edit it all together. Uh, sometimes they do music. Sometimes they do sound effects. Sometimes they do song and dance. It's No, I don't, I'm not sure about the song and dance. I think oh. we're the only ones that oh, that's right. sweat that much when, over these stories. When are we going to do our all-musical episode? <laughs> I thought the all-singing no, episode right. was voice. last week. Wait. No, it wasn't. There was. We don't, I don't think we even sang once last week, did we? I, I didn't I, expect I, the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> oh, now you've done it. They're on their way over here right now. No, nobody expects the Spanish uh, in, in, in fact, those those who do suspect it or expect it. Terrible. Talking to myself here. Yeah. So the alarm or the alcarm. <laughs> this is a story that I accepted. Uh, I believe our, our readers liked it. I read it and said, go ahead and send an acceptance letter to the author. And Big had nothing to do with it. So if you hated this story, 
What? You also hate Rish. Yeah, and that's fair. Does that bother you when I over when I go over your head like that? Not really. If you went over my head and accepted a story that I absolutely despised, then it might bother me, but I didn't feel that way, so it's fine. There have been times, I think, that I've accepted stories even though you hadn't read them because I knew that you would like them as well. I think our 100th episode story, I think I told uh, Nicole whoa, 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 whoa. to... I'm sorry. Have you been to the future and you know what our 100th episode is? I do. Yes, I, I have come from the future. What are gas prices like where you come from? They're actually much, much lower. Oh, well, we got something to look forward enough, to. Because people all drive fuel cell vehicles when we get to our 100th episode. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a while. Okay, so I'm sorry. I, I interrupted your <laughs> fanciful story. Our 100th episode is a story that I'm not familiar with? Well, you are familiar with it now, but I told Nicole to go ahead and accept it before you'd even read it. And then I think like the next day, just by chance, you happen to get on there and, oh, I'll read this one. It's like, this one sucks! And yeah, you thought it sucked. But that's okay, because it's our 100th episode. It works out sometimes. I, I think there's been a few that were like that where I said, yeah, let's go ahead and go with this one. E even though I never let you read it, I was right in guessing that you would like it. And you were right, I think, in this case, too. Although, didn't you just assume that this was some kind of a, a pseudonym that I had sent my own story in under? <laughs> you know, that's true. I can't even explain it, really, without it being boring. But the name Harris Tobias, it just screamed fake name to me. <laughs> and I went into our big file folder with all the submissions. Even the stuff that Regina Bot Glee wrote or is in this folder. And there was no story by I. Harris Tobias in there. And I was like, oh, methinks. Well, I didn't get beyond methinks. I just laughed that I would use the, the, the term methinks. I thought, wow, I think that this is a story that big wrote and snuck in here and, <laughs> and and that's why i can't find it so he will be delighted that i liked the story and uh, will go ahead and accept it and there's no need for him to read and review his own story <laughs> but it turns out harris tobias was not me I, I think the reason you you assumed automatically that it screams fake name is because you always for fun will uh use tobias as though it were your own middle name Remember a couple episodes ago where there was the guy with the two middle names? Oh, right. Uh-huh. We talked about that, and you said, Do you, have you ever known anybody with, without a butthole? And I said, yes, <laughs> there was this kid down the street. I said, no, yes, you, every morning when I go to the bathroom. I said, have you ever known any, you said, have you ever known anybody with two middle names? And I, I hadn't, because that's just greedy. <laughs> um, but when I was born, my father wanted my middle name to be a certain thing, and my mother absolutely refused. Mm -hmm. And I guess in a moment of peak, he's like, well, then he won't have a middle name. Uh, that'll be the day. The Duke <laughs> was my dad. And, and so, you know, I've just gone my whole life without a middle name, and I've enjoyed inserting whatever is on my mind to be that middle name. Uh, and that is the origin of that. I, I don't know that you know that story because I never tell anybody that story. Well, but. you've let the cat out of the bag. And once you let it out, you can't get it back in. No, no, it's not some horrible secret. I just... It's too sometimes late. I will use Tobias and, and that I... disgusting, vile secret is out. It's too late to take it back. Yes, I was born with three nuts and a vagina. <laughs> you guys were nominated for a Parsec? What is the problem with that? You know, my mom did the same thing to all of my sisters, how, interestingly enough, because uh, my mom just thought it would be wise because, you know, when you're a woman and you get married, you take your husband's name and then you wind up with extra names or you have to dump a name or whatever it is you wind up deciding to do. And so my mom just kind of named all my sisters just... First and last. First name, last name. And then when they got married, then they had first name. And then, and then their last name is their middle name. And then, you know, their new married name is their last name. So what if they didn't get married? They would always be I guess be they're just stuck with just two names. They're to, to be honest, Anklovich is probably like three names. That's just, <laughs> it's so long and unwieldy. That's true. Well, I guess I can ask you what you thought of the story. Is it possible that you hadn't read the story until today as a matter of fact yeah you told me that i would love it 
<laughs> did I? I but I didn't need to bother because you thought it was my story and I would already know it, but I let it go until today. And yeah, we uh, we actually just listened through the final product of the uh, story and uh, it was my first chance to actually hear it through. It was good stuff. As we got towards the end of the story, I was sure wishing that that dragon would eat the mayor though. I just couldn't stand that guy. I don't know who voiced him, but he was a douche and a half. See, I would have gone with Prong. Oh, okay. If, if I recall correctly, see, because Marshall is sort of the director of the project, and he told the voice actors the way that he wanted them to do their parts. And uh-huh. I believe he was telling the actor who did the voice, I'm sorry, actor, the guy who did the voice of the mayor. Yeah, the actor's mayor, a little strong. To channel Thurston Howell the <laughs> third, uh, who, who was Jim Backus's character from Gilligan's Island. And then, I think he also said, but uh, kind of ran it back a little bit, you know. Don't stick in the word lovey in there and stuff, so. It has been a while since I'd seen Gilligan's Island, so we actually had to pull up some YouTube clips of the show just to uh, get us a little uh, refresher. Although I think Rish was ready to go with it the second uh, he he read the words. I had to uh, take a look at it. I think eventually the uh, Thurston kind of boiled off. And we were left with a voice that was okay. <laughs> but I think to well, begin with, it was a little over the top and awful. Had you known that the mayor was in on it, on the scam, would that have changed the way that you did the voice? Maybe, but I don't think so. I think I probably would have still done it about the same. I think I may have seen that bit, that last couple of lines, before we actually started recording. So I think I may have already known that he was in on it. Oh, so there's that. And I got to do my award, well, award nominated old man voice. Yeah. Although I tried to switch it up so it didn't sound exactly like my other ones. I love doing old man voices. It's just preparations for five years from now when I yeah. actually am an old man. When you sound like that in everyday conversation. I like the way things used to be more than the way things are. That's kind of summing up every episode that we've done in a a nutshell. Just a a tight, encompassing... Why does Spider-Man have to shoot organic webs out of his arms? Wait, are you you mocking me or are you mocking Spider-Man? Because I I can't allow one of them to stand. (laughs) We'll let the listeners decide what gets mocked. Did you hear about the, the Batman casting? Are we speaking of Catwoman? Or something else. Oh, I was talking about Tom Hardy as Bane, but... Uh, it, oh, Tom Hardy. Did they cast I have Cat no freaking well? idea who that is. Who's Tom Hardy? Tom Hardy's a British actor. He's a handsome dude. He was yeah? the English guy in Inception that oh, okay. uh, was I like a really is, smooth then. dresser. And, right, yeah, I know and who that I, is. And I first knew him from the worst of the Star Trek movies, wherein he plays the clone of Captain Picard in uh, Nemesis. But huh, uh, I do remember that. But he's playing Bane, and Bane is one of those characters that's new from the 90s. Uh-huh. I recall him from Batman and Robin. One of your favorite films of all time. I think a lot has been said about how bad Batman and Robin is, so I probably don't need to reiterate it, but... <laughs> It is one of the great wonders, the great questions, the unanswered questions of our time. Right alongside the Lindbergh baby, the JFK assassination, Batman and Robin. We may never know, maybe once all the players are dead, the truth will come forward that somebody had a vested interest in seeing the death of the Batman franchise. There was a, uh, there was a magic bullet aimed right at Batman's head. (laughs) Someone was short-selling Warner Brothers stock or something. (laughs) I can imagine Judy Dench saying, When Batman and Robin was released in 1997, several investors made billions of dollars (laughs) short-selling the stock. Sorry, of course, that's not a good Judy Dench. Wait, I didn't need to tell you that wasn't a good Judy Dench. No. Yeah, uh, so Tom Hardy is going to play that guy, and he uh, is significant. The The Bane character is significant because they introduced him as this villain who, I, I guess he's intelligent, and he takes some kind of steroid, some kind of experimental drug that makes him incredibly strong. He had studied Batman. I, I believe he was a criminal, and he had been in prison for most of his life. 
and he'd studied all that he could about Batman and just couldn't wait until he got out and would be able to fight Batman. And in their first encounter, he actually not only defeated Batman, but he broke Batman's back. Oh. And uh, Batman had to go into retirement, and there was an argument about who would replace Batman while he recuperated or if he would ever recuperate. And, uh, you know, there's a possibility that they'll touch on that subject matter in this. I mean, it doesn't sound like something that Nolan would shy away from. Right. Even the title, The Dark Knight Rises, could. Could have something to do with that. He comes back from a uh, a season-ending injury. Yeah, but I, and he I, runs for twice as many yards the next year. Yeah, you can do it, Rudy. <laughs> Wait, was that was that what you were referring to? Good job, announcer man. Sort of. Rudy didn't really do all that much. Oh, f you, announcer man. <laughs> That's what she said. But it is the same sport, anyways. You know, who who knows? By the time that movie comes out next year, it'll probably be one of those things where we know it all. <laughs> hopefully not hopefully nolan has enough power that they will avoid that unknown trailer kind of thing the uh awesomeness of that movie will surely bring about the uh second coming i think <laughs> once again a prophesied end of days or whatever it was yeah <laughs> he's like my children i had to return when i heard how awesome the dark knight was Just- i traveled back in time from the year 2047 to see this movie because it is still sold out in the future but its awesomeness has brought about an age of peace and prosperity, eliminating war and hunger. Oh. The aliens show up. We came to see the dark night. <laughs> From now on, every day shall be like Christmas. <laughs> Except today, son. I gotta check this out. Santa? But yeah, the other big casting announcement was Anne Hathaway. Now, I, I don't believe they ever said Catwoman. No, I think they always called her Selena Kyle. And now that could be just like a a wink to the people that are in the audience, the few geeks that are pushing up their glasses and going, oh, I'm already half hard. <laughs> that they know who Selena Kyle is. And that's before the uh, credits even started to roll. No, I was saying uh, members of the press that were pushing up their glasses. Oh, and oh. Like, oh. <laughs> but I'm a huge fan of Anne Hathaway. As you would know, if you ever heard episode zero, I mentioned her even then, our very first wow, show. Wow, really? And I haven't heard episode zero in two and a half years. Good for you, sir. Neither have they. <laughs> Most people have never heard it at all. But uh, yeah, she's she's cast as Selena Kyle, and that is uh, Catwoman's alter ego. Is that the... Catwoman's real name. Yes. I think uh, Catwoman would be the alter ego. Okay. Secret know. identity? Can we... There you go. That'll be good. I'll meet you in the middle. Hell no, Rich Affield. And see, now, I really, really like Batman. Of all the DC Comics characters, Batman is my favorite. But I'm not as attached to all the minutia uh, of Batman as I am to the Marvel stuff that I like. And, 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 he, and here's another thing. And of course, this is going to incur the wrath of anybody who likes DC Comics. But you and I both know this is true. They have no respect for their own source material. Anybody wants to come forward and say, you know, this is the new origin for Wonder Woman, or this is the new thing with Batman. <laughs> they go, yeah, go right ahead. We don't care that the character has been around for 70 years. You make up whatever you like, even if it's completely contradictory. So for a long time there, Batman's parents were killed by this guy named Joe Chill. And then for a long time there, no one knew who killed Batman's parents. And I always liked that, that it's like, well... That criminal could still be out there. And every day he has to get up and go and fight crime again because that guy may still be on the street. Uh-huh. And then a little while later, they said, you know, the guy that killed Batman's parents was Joe Chill and, and he's dead. And then they were like, well, no, no, no. What if Joe Chill was just had something to do with it? But, you know, but he wasn't working for him by himself. What if, what if there's some kind of conspiracy? And the powers that be at DC Comics say yes. All of these things are true. (laughs) They just go back and retcon it each time. And that's an oversimplification, but that's kind of how it is. And then they say, wait, wait, wait. What if the guy said, ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? Oh, you know, I forgot about that. Yes, for a little while, the Joker killed Batman's parents. (laughs) Well, not to, you know, I don't don't want to throw water on your, they just say yes to everything. But you recall Spider-Man 3, right? I do. And the uh, retcon of who killed Uncle Ben, which is almost exactly the same as what you're talking about. Yes, that's true. 
That was pretty uh, lame, is I guess the best thing I can come up with for it. Yes, I, let, but let sorry, me, go on with your point because I, I, I'm derailing Marvel it. is guilty of that as well. It's they they they've done that sort of thing too, and plus Marvel has a bunch of different imprints, and each one has their own origin and That's all that true. stuff. So, and all of that stuff is unforgivable. But you know, but they got to get those forty-year-old guys still living with their parents to buy the comics somehow. Yeah, and at a certain point, it's like the soap operas that endlessly go on as the world turns and days of our lives and et cetera that have been going for General Hospital, going for like 30 and 40 years, these shows. You know, you got to keep coming up with stories because those are on like five days a week, I think. They, they come up with each freaking crazy thing, you know, and similar is the way comic books are, you know, each character has a book that comes out at least a book once a month and they got to keep coming up with stories for it so i guess at a certain point you start just grasping at whatever you can grasp at i hear you but these things don't happen in a vacuum there are these people called editors who are Uh paid that's their job 20 or eight hours a day uh to sit down and say oh well i know that you're saying that betty brant's brother said this but Back in an old issue, he was killed off, so he he can't be in this, and, and that's their job. Right. And so often these people don't do it. They're just like, eh. And, and that's really frustrating, but uh, that's beside the point. There's a lot of things that are wrong with comic books, and that's one of them. But uh, with the Catwoman character, I guess what, what I was trying to get to is there have been different interpretations of the character of Catwoman, uh-huh. and the way that they did it in Tim Burton's Batman Returns was, you know, that she was this mild-mannered secretary and she nearly died. She was resurrected by cats, if you want to say that. And uh, she was sort of loony, sort of crazy, sort of unhinged. Sort of hot. And uh, a lot of people I know really, really, really dislike that movie and that interpretation of Catwoman. I don't. I I, I happen to love it. I I really love Batman Returns. (laughs) Michelle Pfeiffer. But... uh, you know, according to Frank Miller, Selena Kyle was a prostitute and she was into S&M and that's why oh. she had a whip and she dressed in leather. But according to Frank Miller, all women are prostitutes. Yeah, I was going to say. And, uh, Have you? You know, some people say, well, oh, she was just working undercover, pretending to be a prostitute. For a long, long time, she was a cat burglar and that's where the name came from. Uh-huh. There, there's a number of ways that Nolan can go about this whole Selena Kyle thing. If he really wanted to, you could completely waste her and not put her in an outfit and not have her be Catwoman and just be a chick. But we'll see. See what he goes for. Maybe he'll leave a uh, little tidbit. Or has he sworn off ever doing a part four? He has said that this Dark Knight, Re- Dark Knight Rises is the last. That it's, it's a trilogy and he'll be done when it's done. Uh-huh. But they've already talked to him about maybe producing a television series about Batman Hmm. and you know that Warner Brothers will want to continue the franchise because that's all they care about. Right. They don't give a crap about Superman who again (laughs) saved your life and my life many times over. I didn't even make any money saving the world. From Solomon Grundy. He sometimes I despair. Anyhow, they're going to try and milk this for as long as they possibly can. And then once they can no longer milk it, they'll reboot it. Oh, yeah. I, now, I wouldn't be surprised if the next movie is start another start reboot. Start milking it again. I think we live in a really exciting time because these Nolan Batman films are not only good, but they seem respected by everyone, not yeah. just comic book fans. But, you it's know, true. obviously it got robbed of an Oscar nomination, but... But it wouldn't this time around, now that they do 10... And, you know, a lot of people say that they do 10 nominations now. Because of it. Because of The Dark Knight. Yeah. And I don't know if there's any truth to that. I think the actual reason behind it would be if we have more nominations for Best Picture, then more movies that the general uh, audience has seen will be nominated. That There'll be more movies that people know up for Best Picture, and they'll tune into the Oscars. People That's what I actually care really enough to watch. It's hard when uh, there's five films that you've never heard of up for Best Picture. You're just like, yeah, well, don't need to bother watching that show. And the ratings plummet when that happens, yeah. when it's all like small independent films. So this is certainly, by the time this episode airs, the Oscars will be right upon us. That's and true. 
social network will win best picture and everybody will be like wow did rich really know that so I, I i don't know why we're talking about batman except for that that's something i'm passionate about i know you quite like batman i do quite like it i quite like catwoman and i think it all stems back to michelle pfeiffer in that outfit when i was a young man Seeing her in that outfit, oh, I think we we talked about that one time. We were out walking around doing our little stroll about the neighborhood, and I think I said something really embarrassing and then happened to look up and, like, two of my neighbors happened to be, like, standing right next to their car, probably as far away from us as I am from you right now. <laughs> and I went, did I really just say that that loud right in front of my neighbors? I always knew that <laughs> Anklevich boy was a pervert. Oh, man, but yeah. That's one of those uh, defining seminal. I wanted a word that meant seminal but wasn't seminal because you know just don't go there. The context of it all could be taken wrong. Defining that's a good word. It was one of those defining images from my youth. Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman. Uh. We may not ever get a chance to talk about this again. Uh huh. Um, when Batman Returns came out in '92, boy that flick captured my imagination i had loved the 89 batman but of everything from the, the music to the tone to that unhappy ending just grabbed me and it's like wow this was the batman for me you mm -hmm. know just as maybe people the, from the previous generation saw the adam west batman as being for them uh -huh. and i just i loved how dark it was and how bleak and and there's that moment when Selena, Kyle, and Bruce Wayne, neither of whom know the other's secret, are dancing uh -huh. together. And may, one of them makes some kind of little pickup line comment that is word for word what Catwoman and Batman said to one yeah, another They were before. fighting each other before and they said the same thing. And then but, as they're dancing, they switch and say the other person's uh, line... And they freeze for a moment, yeah. looking at each other, both of them realizing who they are dancing with. Uh -huh. And my God, that's the best moment in it's that whole film. So it's just great. such a fantastic moment where they don't know what to do. And it changes their whole relationship. And it changes it's you know, so whatever great. they might have been feeling toward this other person to know who they actually are with. And, and the line that uh, Michelle Pfeiffer says right there, she goes, does this mean we have to start fighting? I just love that moment. It was so good. I do too. And until Dark Knight came out, that was easily my favorite of all the Batman movies. Yeah, it's funny. It's mine go, too. I would mine go too. 10 rounds with my cousin <laughs> or with real diehard DC yeah. fans because they just hate it. They yeah, hate so many people do. They hate it the way that I hate Batman and Robin, I guess, or Batman Forever. How could they hate but, it that bad, though? That doesn't make any sense. But these same people didn't have a problem with the Joker killing Batman's parents or being killed at the end of that first movie. You know, I, I don't really get it, but there are certain things that I hate, and it's difficult to express why I hate a certain Katy Perry song or why I hate the CG Transformers movies. It's just a visceral thing. It's an emotional thing. It's a gut thing, and they hate mm -hmm. Batman Returns. But I wish Nolan luck because despite how talented this guy is as a filmmaker, how the hell do you follow up Dark Knight? <laughs> I think it's unlikely that he can top it. But then again, I guess it was on the Gets My Goat that we spoke about Tangled, right? So some people may not have heard me talk about that, but uh, I mentioned the whole sequel thing. And how movies tend to make a lot of their money, especially their open weekend money, based on how good the last movie in this series was. I don't know what kind of money, but I swear that this movie is going to make like insane money the opening weekend. It's, I'm sure, going to be the number one opening weekend of all time, which these days doesn't seem to be a big deal. I don't know if the inflation is just so run away or what, but, and there's 3D tickets too. So every movie opens to be a record movie, but that movie, Dark Knight Rising, going to be an insane opening weekend. And if it's not complete crap, it'll definitely top the first movie and may well come close to, if not beat its own money that it made before just because of how good both of the movies were leading up to it it may well make a lot of money just based on how good the last movie was that everybody that saw that movie is going to go and see the next one even if they hear bad things people say you know eh, it wasn't as good as dark knight 
it was kind of weak. They'll still go and be like, well, I'll have to go and see just how weak it is. But that's just the kind of feeling I get for this movie, that as long as he doesn't totally blow it and do it just an absolute piece of crap, Batman and Robin level piece of crap, then, you know, he's, he's going to be able to wallpaper his house in $100 bills from what he makes off of that movie. Just to put a nail in it at least for six months or so until they start shooting this sucker and we see pictures of, of how they're going to do Catwoman. Do her again and again. Oh, that's not what you meant? Uh, Sorry. The, the thing that makes her interesting is that she's not completely bad and she's not completely good, but she's a completely sexual character. She's totally <laughs> sexy. That predatory female imagery that causes dudes like me to just quake <laughs> you know somebody that uses their body that uses their feminine wiles to get their way or, or or whatever it would be and that's something that will be fun to see the dynamic with christian bale's bruce wayne because you know even though he had feelings for the katie holmes character or the maggie gyllenhaal character for the rachel dawes character or whatever he really seems to be a disciplined hard line fun free kind of guy right he he leads with his brain with and and yeah it'll be interesting to see if this chick can break through that the the, the thing that the nolan batman movies are not is fun we had fun with the joker i think but he was so scary or so crazy i mean he found maggie gyllenhaal beautiful uh, <laughs> that that it was it was a, a kind of tense, nervous yeah, horror it's a movie fun. Creepy fun, fun where, where he says something and you kind of titter at it like, eh, eh. it's like, <laughs> ew. But unless Nolan goes the Michelle Pfeiffer route and has Selena be mentally unstable, she should just be fun and no worry that, that this chick could snap at any time. You know, the Catwoman of the comic books is not a mass murderer or anything like that. You know, right. she. She has a line that she won't cross, and uh, I, I don't know if she has a tragic past to draw on that gets her out there doing this stuff. I think it's more just the rush of being able to go out there and flaunt her body and take whatever she wants and swing away and do it again the next night. And to me, that sounds really interesting, really fun. You know, and in some ways, that's what the Robin character embodies, is, is somebody that goes out there and it's just like, woohoo! this is great and batman's like stop it be quiet kind of thing <laughs> and and that's a dynamic we're never going to get in the nolan verse and chances are nobody's going to be brave enough to have a 10 year old robin is that how old robin's in, supposed to be is as young as 10 I, well i don't know i mean now he's 25 or whatever but i think dick grayson was just a little kid yeah Wow. And uh, the Tim Drake one, I think, was like 12 or 13 when he uh -huh. became Robin, and now he's in high school or something like that. But just somebody that goes out there and, and says, don't you understand? This is fun. We get to go out there and beat people up and do flips, and you have all these cool devices. And Batman is just humorless, and, and, and he's like, <laughs> no, criminals are a cowardly and superstitious lot. It's like, and we have to prey on them so that they don't prey on the innocent. The psychosis of Batman is so interesting because he is so close to being insane himself. Right. He's so close to being a villain. And, and maybe not. Maybe there is a line that Batman will never cross, so we know that he'll never be a villain. But in the eyes of somebody like a Superman or, you know, a Boy Scout type of guy, right. Batman lives in a world of grays. I don't know because I don't know the DC universe well enough. But I would imagine that when all these Justice League guys get together and Aquaman and Flash and Green Lantern are all having cups of coffee and stuff, you know, they look over their shoulder at Batman and it's like, Ugh. <sighs> so as long as he stays on the other side of the room kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, they just go, <laughs> Ew. But enough about that. Criminals are a cowardly superstitious lot, but so are villagers. The villagers in the alarm. <laughs> wow. That was a nice uh, circular segue. Well, the stuff about the cat burglar, about Catwoman going out and stealing from these people and being able to use her feminine wiles, go, feminine wiles her God-given charms hey, there, to get... Hey, there ain't no God-given. She earned all that. Hard work. Are we going to have to talk about this? Now, did, did, now, do you think Anne Hathaway earned the way that she looks? To a point. You don't have a body like that without doing a whole lot of work to have it. 
I know because I'm fat and I don't do a whole lot of work to keep that up. Well, maybe I do. I, I have to eat a lot to remain as fat as I am. Huh. And I don't know. I mean, obviously there's some God-given-ness to that whole thing. Because some people are born good-looking and some people aren't. <laughs> but beyond that, so, you've got to put some work into that. And, you know, maybe that's a sexist thing to say. Although I am one of those people that believes that there is a genetic lottery that some people have won. And uh, you don't do a hell of a lot to win the lottery. But she goes out there and she uses her gifts to get what she wants. And she has a good time with it. And, and the two main characters in this story, they were never accepted by the town. The people in the town were kind of a-holes. And so they came up with a way to separate the town from their riches and go their separate ways. And uh, that had to have been fun. That had to have been something. The, the, you know, the, the, the beauty of the heist, uh -huh. the scam, you know, that kind of thing. Those, those kind of movies are entertaining. You know, sort of watching these people put together a plan to take down the corrupt businessman or to take down the, the sheriff of Nottingham yeah. or whoever it might be, the, the, the person on top that shouldn't be there. And we love to see those people fall. And, and, and there's a fun catharsis of seeing the rich get taken advantage of and get those riches taken away. And yeah, that's why people love Ocean's Eleven so much. Because it's people as dirty as like casino owners being taken down. And yeah, they, those, those kind of movies are fantasy. They're escapist fantasy. Because mm -hmm. so often in real life, the corrupt, nasty politician never gets his comeuppance. You know, the rich, wealthy people with a number in their name will always be rich. Like Thurston Howell the food. Yeah, and that's something that we long He got for. his comeuppance. He got stuck in a desert aisle for years. With Gilligan. <laughs> yeah, that's as bad as it can get. These stories, uh, I mentioned Robin Hood. You know, he stole from the rich and he gives to the poor. We stood up to the man and gave him what for? Our love for him now. <laughs> it ain't hard to explain. Oh, no more singing. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, good thing he doesn't. The hero of Canton, the, the man, man they call Jane. Jane. Take that, announcer man. Yeah, up yours. <laughs> How uh, could you? Th there is something that just every person gets a charge out of that, of seeing mighty brought low. Mm hmm. So I, I think that's what I liked about this story. I thought that it was just a straightforward fantasy story. And then when we got to the end, I had a big smile on my face. I was uh -huh. like, ah, because he had fooled me as well. Nice. It didn't occur to me that there might be some kind of heist going on. I, and now I don't know if, if I am interpreting the word heist correctly, but... No, I think that applies. Should I look it up on dictionary.com? No. Good. Hell no, big Anklevich. Whoa. Welcome to the show. Got a mildly offensive guest star here in the studio today. All right. Announcer man, you're supposed to be watching the door. Uh-huh. <laughs> very short story it was. I think it was only like 15 minutes or so. And uh, had we not been talking about Batman, this episode would also be very short. Yeah, it would be over by now. But, but I like the short stories every now and then because, A, it gives us a chance to get an episode in on time, which usually isn't the case because we always do these long, epic stories which take twice as long to produce so it's nice to get a little change of pace yeah not a tremendous more needs to be said about the story yeah, it was fun it was a good story and it said its piece i think that's one of our main criteria for the show yeah is that a story needs to be fun and you know sometimes being scared is fun sometimes being sad is fun uh, <laughs> but yeah, usually laughing or being surprised is where the fun comes from. And, and yeah, I, th I think that's cool. Sometimes boot to the head is fun. Boot to the head. <laughs> Here we are. We're the princes of the universe. Give me a break. <clears throat> so, Rish, you remember last time when we had uh, Abby Hilton on the show to give you some romantic advice? Yes, unfortunately. Wait, wait. did you get her back again? Oh, thank you. Now I can make it all up with her. You'll see. Uh, actually, she's not here. She's not coming back. Sorry. Oh, no. She's killed herself, hasn't she? This is on you, Big. Now I'll never find out what happens to Silvio. No, no, she's fine. 
Last I heard, she was giving romantic advice to death row inmates. She said it was more likely to get a positive outcome than, than with you. Oh, well, no argument there. So why are you bringing all this up? Well, I mentioned your problem to another friend of mine, uh, and she volunteered to come forward and continue uh, preparing you for Valentine's Day. Really? That sounds pretty unlikely, actually. No, the real trick is if we can get her to come back next week. You've got to, to step up your game, man. But I have no game. Right, I, uh, I keep forgetting that. But we have a great podcaster and friend of the show, Julie Hoverson, here to aid us tonight in a segment we like to call Hoverson Helps, Helps the Hopeless. The hopeless. That's catchy. Don't screw it up, okay? We don't really have many more friends whose last name starts with H, all right? No, I'm nervous. Oh, don't be. No, this is just all practice. Uh, but do your best. Just hit her with your best shot. Fire away. Wait, was that from a Pat Benatar song? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Julie, uh, are you here? Sure am. Thanks for having me on the show. Are you kidding? Thank you. You have no idea what my life's like. The emptiness, the crying myself to sleep, the clutching my pillow at night and calling it Brenda, the baby bottles that... Whoa, whoa, Harish. Too much information there. This is what we talked about, remember? Right, right. I, I was just joking, Julie. I don't even own a Brenda. Or pillow. <laughs> okay. So, Big, how is this going to work? Uh, just help Rish to know what to say and, and to do. Give him advice. Uh, you see him at the checkout line, the grocery store, and your eyes meet. You know him from somewhere and you approach him. Uh, Rish, isn't it? It is. Hi, uh, Julie Hoverson, right? Right. We know each other from somewhere. Big, where do we know each other from? Oh, from, from, from 19, 19 Nocturne Boulevard. Boulevard. Have we started yet? Uh, I'm sorry, that was uh, Rish's fault. So, you know each other from school or work or uh, funeral last Wednesday. It doesn't matter. Let's just get to the role play. Uh, Rish, greet her again. Hi, Julie. I'm glad I ran into you. You are? Yes, because I... Well, what do I say here? Not just uh, I remembered you from before and thought you were cool, right? <laughs> heard worse. All right. I'm glad because I remember you from that thing where we met. You seemed cool. And you smelled like a spring breeze. That was worse. I'm sorry. A fall breeze? Like like with leaves and, and scarecrows and stuff? Calm down, Rish. Julie, he really is trying here, but do women like to be complimented on their smell? Sometimes. It depends on the guy. Oh, great. I'm screwed. No, no. I mean, how close you are to the guy, uh, personally-wise. If we know each other and are on a date or something, it's great to hear, wow, you really smell nice tonight. But if it's a guy in the supermarket you've only ever met doing voice work... Or at a funeral? Or at a funeral, yeah. It's probably a little creepy. Oh, great. There's that word again. I might as well have it tattooed across my forehead. Stop it, dude. You're just gonna scare another one away. Julie's a friend, and she'll help you be less creepy if you just let her. That's right. If you're paying that much attention to smell, you're probably either a serial killer or gay. And don't comment if the girl doesn't smell nice either. That's generally a put down to. So you said you were glad to see me. Maybe you should subtly find out if I'm seeing anyone, and if not, ask me out. And you'll say yes? Really? In this make-believe scenario for a podcast with only one listener, yes. Shoot, Big, you didn't tell her that Nigel stopped listening? Find out if she's single, dude. You're making me nervous with all this. It's like watching an acupuncturist with Parkinson's disease or something. Well, what, wait, what does that mean? I don't know. You wrote it. Oh. Well, see, I, I figured it had to be something that you needed a steady hand for. And then I asked myself, who, what would the shakiest person in the whole... Guys, have you forgotten about me? I don't have a lot of spare time. I have three audio drama episodes to write and edit in the next hour. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. You think I'm kidding? So, so Julie, are you still single? Be subtle, Rish. Okay, Julie, are you still available, if you know what I mean? That's not subtle. You might as well ask for my 1-900 number. All right. Uh, 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 Julie, are you on Facebook? 
as a matter of fact, I am. What's your relationship status? Not subtle either, but at least you're trying. No, I am not currently seeing anyone. Wow, wh- what a coincidence. I'm never seeing anyone. Desperate much? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I mean, I recently came off a near miss in the area of love, leaving me free to look at you and contemplate the possibilities. Do you ever do that? Contemplate possibilities? Uh, did you just make that up or is that from a movie or something? I made it up, but I pictured Pierce Brosnan saying it in my place. Is it okay to quote from others? I think so. Perhaps a bit of poetry or a line from a song sprinkled into the conversation can make you sound more erudite and romantic. I know movies more than anything, so could I, could I throw in a movie line in there too? I guess so, but don't be too obvious. You're the best thing to ever happen to a bum like me, Julie. Nothing from Die Hard, Rish. I'm sorry. So, uh, so we've established that you're single, right? I guess. Why? Because I, I, I was hoping... Yes? I was hoping we might go out sometime. Just just hang out someplace and, and talk. You'll make fun of the skaters in Central Park. Skaters? You know, when they fall down or get mugged on their way back to their car. We're, um, we're not in New York, Rish. Details. I, I just mean go somewhere with no pressure where I could get to know you better. I wouldn't be against that. You wouldn't? Did you hear that, Big? She wouldn't be against that. Uh, I'm not here, Rish. Right, right, right. I, I can't wait to tell my friend Big that you agreed to go out with me. Big, huh? Tell me more about your friend. Damn it. Reality is interrupting our game. And I thought I might actually get ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just joking around. You're actually doing fine. Very well. So, where were we? You were just about to ask me out. Okay. How about Friday? How about Friday what? How about Friday, Julie? No, ask a specific question. Try and be assertive. You need a yes or no answer. All right. Julie, how does Friday sound for us to get together? Sorry, I'm busy on Friday. Oh, come on! Look, you have to roll with the punches. Be assertive, remember? Yeah, but don't, don't just blow me off. This is supposed to be a teaching exercise. You're whining again. Listen. Maybe I really am busy on Friday. Knowing me, I'm busy all the time. Just because someone turns down your first invitation doesn't mean you should give up. Now try it again. Okay, oh, Friday's out. Well, what are you doing Saturday? I don't know. What do you have in mind? Like I said, go somewhere and get to know you. Talk. Maybe get something to eat. Do you eat? Occasionally. Hey, we, we have something in common. <laughs> What time do you want to pick me up? I don't know. What time sounds good to you? Be assertive, remember? Oh, uh, uh, how about seven? Seven is good. It's a date then? Yep. Looking forward to it. Really? Well, wow, me too. I'll see you then. Not bad, huh? Now say your farewells and make it memorable. All right. Um, uh, you have a good one. You can do better than that. Give me something to think about. Uh, you know, Julie... If a Terminator can learn the value of human life, maybe we can too. You had me and then you lost me. I had you? Crap! Okay, okay, that's all the time we have for this installment of Hoverson Helps the Hopeless. Thank you, Julie, for showing up. (sighs) And for not hanging up. Bye-bye now. There's a reason I live with cats. (laughs) That was, uh, you, you, you did all right there, man. That wasn't too bad. Think there's hope for me, man? There was never much hope. Only a fool's hope. Whoa. See what I did there? You're the coolest guy I know. Yes, I am. Now, on with the countdown. One last thing before we go. We've still got that incentive episode up there. I don't know if everybody knows about it. If you donate to the show uh, in the next little while, right? I think we left it open-ended. If it's 2014 and you're just listening to this episode for the first time, you could specifically ask for home runs as your incentive, just in case we've changed it up since then, which is possible. It's likely. Right. It was the first experiment we did where we did an entire episode. You know, it has the banter afterward where we talk about it and talk about stuff. And we're giving that to anybody who donates to the show. You can just go to doonsteef.com, click on the PayPal button, 
and you can donate to help us pay our authors, to help us host the website. You know, I, I think they charge us just to have bandwidth so people can download the show. So that's appreciated. I just wanted to remind people in case you didn't know about it, that uh, you can get that incentive. You can get a little reward or punishment, depending on how much you <laughs> like the story, for donating. That's it. right. It's a special story written by our very own Rish Outfield. So if you swing that way, feel free to toss some change our way. Cool. And yeah, I, I hope that that's successful because if it is, then that means we'll do it again. Yeah. And if, if you create something and people like it, then you're all the more willing to create more. That's right. So there we are. Thank you for uh, listening all the way through to the end of the episode. Thanks for uh, hanging around. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it for that. So I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Chalupa for you, Big. Oh, Chalupa for you, Rish. Thanks. Right, Chalupa for you, announcer man. Chalupa for you, Rish. Oh, Chalupa for you, announcer man. Chalupa for you, Big. See how long we can keep this up. Chalupa for you, Marshall Latham. Yeah, Chalupa. Chalupa for you, Wendy. Chalupa for all. And Chalupa for everyone. Amen. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. See you later, everybody. Take two. You should say that right off. Before you should stop echoing. I cannot help myself. It feels so good. So good. Ah, make it stop. I can't get the plug in there. That's what she said. <sighs> Boy, this, it's so weird to be bringing stories once again into the homes of people on the rag. <laughs> yes, yeah, very weird. Music. Hold on. Sound effects. We've got plugs. Oh, I thought that my hair looked quite realistic, actually. <laughs> yeah. You want to try looking in the mirror before you go out. Oh, my heart can't take that kind of shock. I don't want to be on this side of the island, Lovey. You can. Let's do it as Thurston Howell the third. Are you ready? Oh, Thurston. There is one you might remember. Old Havemile on the bagel. <laughs> Skipper! Wait, wait. Hold on, let me see what he said. He says, uh, Howl from Gilligan's Island. Oh, don't lay it on so thick it becomes a parody. Oh. Oh, darn. Guess I better do another take. Go. I don't like the way things are compared to the way they used to be. I do that whole, we didn't have any fancy video games. There was one game in town. It was a game called Stare at the Sun. We'd climb up to the tallest hill and look at the sun until our eyes burst into flames, and we loved it. <laughs> All right. Superstitious nonsense. I saw a dragon once. Turned out to be my mother-in-law. <laughs> Oh, I, th I thought I saw a dragon once turned out to be my mother-in-law. I wasn't reading it right. I once shot an elephant in my pajamas. How did he get in your pajamas? I don't know. Ah, let's see. Ah, the tower. When I was a boy, we didn't have all these fancy video games. There was only one game in town, and it was called... <laughs> Merry Christmas, the old no, Bailey Belden and Long. Your voice has changed. No, it's dry. You need to go back to when I was a boy. Yeah, it's like Marge Simpson over there. Well, I'm not going to flee my home or lose my fortune because of a bunch of old legends. Yeah. I'm the dream maker. Ah! Old Havermeyer was so old. How old was he? He was so old that the dust... No, I don't know. Suggestions ranged from taking down the tower to digging... <clears throat> sorry. I'm saying sorry to myself. Sorry. Sorry.
Oh, that's quite quite all right. You're doing all right. Keep up the good work. Okay, thank you. The villagers ro the village the village the village people y m c a I announced to the council that it was all true. A dragon, a dragon. I swear I saw a dragon with big red teeth and big red eyes and da 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 da. da. Sorry, that's uh, Pete's dragon there. They will be grateful for the peace that has brought them. Ah. Well, I don't have to read this part anyway. Who cares? The mayor was right. We would never meet again. Thank you for joining us today on the Classic Tales podcast. Oh, wait a minute. That's not right. The mayor was right. We would never meet again. Well, that was our story, folks. Hope you enjoyed it. This has been the Drabblecast. Wait! Crap! I did it again! The mayor was right. We would never meet again. And that was our story. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, come on. Come on. That's not even my voice. That's Steve Ely. Steve Ely doesn't even do a skate pod anymore. Oh, this is ridiculous. Forget it. I quit. Author's note. Okay, when I wrote <laughs> The Alcarm, now I, gotta find I was this. so drunk I spelled it A-L-A-R-M. You should say that right off. Before you we'll... should stop echoing. I cannot help myself. Cannot help myself. It feels so good. It feels so good. Ah, make it stop. I can't get the plug in there. That's what she said. <sighs> Adventure. It's embarrassing me. <laughs> You're embarrassing me. <laughs> you want me to? I almost don't. Are you sure? This is your thing. You're the director, man. Well, you want me to do it in some kind of a accent? Barbie, Captain Barbie, for years, Barbie doll abandoned us in the middle of a leaky toy box. <laughs> that Mario. <laughs> Crawling with roaches and dust mites. Captain Doll never bothered to check our progress. Well, I think the closer it sounds to the real movie, the funnier it should be. You know, like him saying, little cowgirl. <laughs> she goes, yippee ki yay, mother. You know, uh-huh. or whatever. <laughs> but I don't know if it's funnier for just Barbie to be silly and stupid and everybody else to be super, super serious. Uh-huh. Or if it's funnier if everybody is s- silly and only the narrator is super serious. Uh-huh. Okay, so, so let's, let's do this again, not as Ricardo Montalban, but I'm just as a more, do very as good a more Ricardo evil Montalban. character. And Should just, I give know. it a little bit of an accent? For years, Barbie doll abandoned us in the middle of a leaky toy box. Is that awful? Uh, just do it. Uh, so Normal. it's recognizable as Ken's voice in all of them. Okay. So just so your, just do my voice. Your voice, but make it more and angry intense. Butthole. You are. Damn, wrong thing again. Sorry, she said. He lives in San Francisco with his wife, Abigail. Why did you make quotes in the air when you said wife? (laughs) You can die too for all I care. (laughs) What? I didn't do nothing. Was all that the pre-story thing? I ought to uh, switch over to... Switch over. I hope we don't have a burnout. (laughs) Easy, Joey. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.